Good afternoon, everybody. I see some activity happening in the chat. If you feel like it, if you feel uh, social today, feel free to drop in um, your name and uh, where in Ohio you're located and if there's an organization that you're um, connected with. Just give it another 30 seconds here and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, we will go ahead and kick things off. I see that chat is getting lots of activities. See some folks from Dayton, Columbus, Cincinnati, Toledo. Welcome, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Erin Ryan. I serve as Groundwork Ohio's Director of the Center for Maternal and Young Child Health. And we're really excited to have you here today for our um, webinar training ahead of Groundwork uh, Budget Advocacy Day, Big Voices for Little Kids, and we're even more excited um, for March 8th when we'll be able to have you all in person with us at the State House. So before we get started, we wanted to make sure um, folks should have received a pre-training survey in your emails. If you have not completed that yet, you can use the QR code here to access that survey, and I think we're going to also Try and drop the link into the chat if it doesn't get buried in all the activity. Uh, my colleague Becca just posted that in the chat. So this just really helps us um, make sure that we can hear from everybody on the training about what you need to feel prepared and really helping us shape the, um, the trainings and the um, preparation that we give to folks. So we really appreciate you taking a minute or two here to fill out that survey if you have not done so yet. And then we wanted to do a nice grounding activity before we kick off the training. So this is an exercise we learned from our friends at Design Impact in Cincinnati. Um, this really helps us clear our heads and, and feel grounded and focus on today's training. So just take a minute here to um, write down on a piece of paper everything else you have to do today. That way it's out of your head and you're focused just on the presentation and being engaged and connected with other folks across the state um, and with our, our groundwork team. All right, so while folks um, are, are doing that, we can go ahead and kind of walk through what is gonna be on today's agenda for our training. So. Um, we're going to do some welcomes about who Groundwork is and an introduction to advocacy. We'll share what our why is as an organization and really talking through how to build a strong case for support. Um, we will give you some details and, and tons of logistics about what to expect on Advocacy Day. Um, our com uh, communications director will talk through some um, communication skills and tools that you can use to really amplify your advocacy work. And then we'll leave some time for questions and next steps. We've got a packed agenda, so let's dig right in. Um, objectives, just so folks kind of know what to expect for today. Um, our main objective is just making sure everyone is trained and feels prepared for Advocacy Day. And then we also want to provide you with some tools that you can use on Advocacy Day and beyond um, as you be, maybe you're beginning your advocacy journey Maybe you're a pro and this is something that you could do in your sleep and, and we're just kind of helping to freshen up some of those skills. So um, we're gonna help folks identify, um, learn to identify uh, your state policymaker. We're gonna walk through a very basic um, understanding of the legislative structure and specifically focused on our state operating budget, which is the kind of um, main focus of advocacy day. We're gonna talk about how to identify messages that resonate with policymakers and how to make sure that um, you're using effective messaging when, when meeting with your legislators and how to tailor a message to those different audiences. We will um, share some stories from some of our um, families and fellows that we work with at Groundwork and really talk about the power of storytelling. And then we'll talk about the importance of follow-up and making sure that the work we do doesn't stop on Advocacy Day, 
it continues um, really uh, into the the uh, the future um, and making sure that our work, um, this collective work we're doing on that day is really a good inflection point to move forward our um, our overarching goal of making change in the state budget for young children and their families in Ohio. So just some housekeeping. I know these are questions that are always asked during trainings. Um, first off, thank you for joining us. Yes, we are recording today's webinar and we will provide everybody with a copy of um, the, the webinar recording as well as the slides that we're doing today. So don't feel like you need to take the, you know, um, very detailed notes. We wanna make sure you're focused and engaged and really paying attention to the conversation today. Um, closed captioning is available through your Zoom settings. So if you um, want or need those, please feel free to, to um, activate that on Zoom. And then um, there's gonna be a lot of content that we're talking through and we wanna make sure that um, all of your questions are answered. So if you do have questions throughout the training, please drop that into the Q&A function. Um, the chat will be used for some other ways to engage that Q&A function just to make sure things don't get lost please use that for questions. Um, we'll have some folks from our team answering questions um, through that function, you know, writing out some answers throughout the presentation, and then we'll take some answers live at the end of the presentation as well. So with that, let's get started. Um, so who is Groundwork? I know from seeing some of the names popping up in the chat that we have a lot of our core partners on, but I know we also have some new folks who maybe are not as familiar with Groundwork. So um, we are a committed nonpartisan policy research and advocacy organization um, that really focuses on championing high quality early learning and healthy development strategies from that prenatal period to age five. And our goal is making sure we are laying a strong foundation for Ohio kids, families and communities. Um, we were formed in 2004 and we're currently led by our president CEO, Shannon Jones. Um, you can see some graphics at the bottom here. These are our three centers of excellence that are housed within Groundwork, our Center for Maternal and Young Child Health, which as I shared, um, I serve as the director of, our Center for Early Learning. You'll hear from our um, Center for Early Learning director later in the presentation, and our Center for Family Voice. So this is where a lot of our policy and advocacy work is housed within the organization. And what do we do? So we, um, we really work to advance that quality early childhood systems and influence those institutions in Ohio by um, engaging, educating, and mobilizing diverse stakeholders and strategic partners. We really make sure that we promote data-driven and evidence-based early childhood policies. So we don't provide the direct services that we advocate for, but we work with those direct service providers. We work with families and other um, folks throughout the community to really come together and do uh, research, policy advocacy, and um, issue education with our state legislature. Great, so now that you know a little bit more about us, uh, we wanted to make sure that as we are thinking about Advocacy Day, um, we're giving some really quick tips and overview of how to be a strong advocate. So we know that advocacy can come from parents and caregivers, early childhood professionals, um, maternal and infant health professionals, and everyday Ohioans who care about their families with young children. And that helps strengthen our policymaking process. So your advocacy is extremely powerful. That's really what we want you to walk away with today of, of understanding your power as an advocate and especially coming together on Advocacy Day with 400 other folks who care about these issues and are there to advocate for them. So I know from um, one of the surveys or the, the registration, we have a lot of new folks who are, who are new to advocacy um, joining us on March 8th. And that can feel a little daunting being your first time really going and having a legislative meeting and so our training today and what we hope you walk away with is that it's, it's not a scary process um, and that you are really the experts to be doing this work. So we're gonna give you some of those skill sets and help you feel prepared walking into your meetings on March 8th. And advocacy can feel like a very big term. What it is, is the, the way we've kind of defined it and, and talk about it 
is an activity that an individual or a group um, does to try and influence decisions within our different systems and institutions. From Groundworks perspective, we uniquely um, work to influence the early childhood space. And so advocacy can be one of our staffers, an individual going in and providing public testimony in support of a bill. But it can also be a really large collective event such as Advocacy Day, where we're gonna have 400 people from across the state really um, representing different sectors and issues within that early childhood space, coming together under that collective voice to advocate on behalf of young children. And we talk about how important advocacy is and um, it's because there, it can make a really big difference in the decisions that are made um, in, with, within our public um, offices. So advocacy is a way that you can make your voice heard on those issues that matter to you, that matter to your family and your community. It helps educate our policymakers and gives them a new perspective. So we know that um, many of our policymakers maybe have different lived experience than us or have never, um, have never you know, had a background in the same kind of issues or way that we've had to navigate the, the policy space. And so being able to go in there and share your story and kind of talk through what your lived experience is gives them a new perspective and it helps them kind of think outside of their own lived experience. Um, it gives us a seat at the policymaking table. So while we might not have a vote on the bills that are happening and moving through our state legislature, advocacy allows us to um, try to make a difference and influence those decisions that are being made. Uh, we know it can inspire others. So kind of seeing other people, especially something like it, Uh, like advocacy day where we are um, really visual can really help uh, build support for the issues across new stakeholders. And lastly, the thing that we all hope our advocacy does is generating positive change for children, families, and communities. So here's some terms. I know sometimes this space can feel like we're throwing out jargon and it, you know, there, it, it's hard to kind of feel grounded in um, in that when for many of us, uh, you know, are maybe new to this space. So here's just some terms to do some level setting with everybody um, that you may hear within um, the materials we provide or on advocacy day. So a general assembly um, in Ohio, we are a full time state legislature. Every state is different. Um, we are currently in the 135th General Assembly and the, uh, the last two years, each GA last two years. So this General Assembly started on January 1st, 2023, and it goes through December 31st, 2024. Um, legislators are those people who are elected to public office. Um, so we have two chambers. We have our state Senate made up of 33 members, and we have our state house. Um, or the House Chamber made up of state representatives that have 99 members. And everybody has two state lawmakers that represent them. So they have a state senator and they have a state representative. And in Ohio, we do have term limits. So um, that limits the number of, for Senate, four-year terms they can serve. And for representatives, that limits the number of two-year terms they can serve. And so a really important thing is, is understanding who represents you at the state level. I know a lot of people have um, really a lot of understanding about who their member of Congress is, who their members of Congress are, who their local electeds are, maybe your school board or your local city council. And many people um, maybe don't know who their state policymakers are. So um, this is a really important exercise. We hope everybody will take a minute here to do. If you go to, uh, I think we're gonna drop the link in the chat. So people can take some time um, now or before your uh, before advocacy day to look up who your state lawmaker is. Um, you'll see some a box on the uh, the right hand side of your screen, right here. Um, that'll pop up when you go to that website. If you put in your full, full address, that includes city and zip code. Hit search. It'll populate who your state lawmakers are. 
you'll have your state senator and your state representative. And there's a lot of information. This website is really what we recommend to get to know your state policymaker. They have their biography on there. They have the committees that they serve on, the bills that they have introduced. Many of them have newsletters you can sign up for. And so this is an important way for you just to get kind of a base understanding of who is my policymaker? Um, especially since we just had redistricting where there were new, new district lines drawn. So there may be a new person representing you who was not representing you in the past. So if folks, as you're going through that exercise, if you wanna drop in the chat um, who your state senator is and who your state representative is, we can kind of see um, some of the different uh, pockets of Ohio where everyone is and who's representing them. And again, um, our hope, and we'll get through this a little bit later, is to make sure that everybody is meeting with their own state legislative office. Um, and so uh, on advocacy day, um, which may not be possible, but our hope is that you can be matched with them so that you get an understanding of um, who that person is and you can really connect with them on, oh, do they serve on the board of a community organization that you donate to or that you volunteer with that you care about? Do they have kids in school around the same age as your own kids? There's those ways that we can really um, connect with them on a personal level to, to really um, move forward the work that we do. I'm seeing some folks dropping in their, their senators and representatives. It's great. So now that we've kind of talked through the baseline of here's what advocacy is, here's how our state legislature works, we want to talk about the budget. That is one of our favorite things at Groundwork Ohio to talk about. Um, and I know we have a lot of other, uh, you know, wonky folks on the phone with us and maybe some new folks, some folks who are newer to the space. So we wanted to give everyone kind of some baseline understanding of the state budget. Um, our advocacy day is again, gonna be focused specifically on what's known as the state operating budget. This is a two year budget, a biennium budget that is required for our legislature to pass. Um, it is a massive document for context. The governor's version that he just released a couple of weeks ago is about 4,000 pages long. So this is a massive bill and it includes how our state funding is being spent. So we as an organization and I know many other folks on the call and everyone coming for advocacy day, all of you wanna make sure that that funding is spent on early learning, on child welfare, on child serving systems. And um, it's really important for us to understand that a lot of the programs that serve kids in Ohio are funded through this state budget. So here's just an, a timeline to kind of help you understand where we are and where we're gonna go with our budget. The governor, it starts with the governor. He introduced his executive budget proposal um, at the State of the Union, excuse me, the State of the State um, in at the end of January. Um, Next, it moves to our house chamber. So hearings have already started. Um, they hold hearings in um, the finance committee is really that powerful committee that controls the, the, um, the budget as it moves through the process. And there are a bunch of different subcommittees where they have different folks from the governor's administration come in and to te testify about what's in there, as well as having public testimony. So, um, as organizations, Groundwork uses that as an opportunity to go in there and testify, but anybody who's a public citizen can go in and testify on this, and they have hearings for public testimony. They'll then make amendments, so those changes to the governor's proposal, and they will pass, they will introduce and pass the House version of the budget. It moves through the Finance Committee and then gets voted on in the full 99-member House. That goes through April, so then in late April, um, it'll move on to the Senate. So the Senate does the same thing. They hold those public hearings. They hold hearings from members of the administration and other key stakeholders. They make their changes. And then we have three versions of our budget. We have the governor's version, the House version, and the Senate version. And so there's a process called conference committee where those differences are reconciled and they have representatives from those three, um, that the executive administration, the House and the Senate, who work behind the scenes to come up with the final version of the budget that is um, passed out of the House and the Senate. 
and then given to the governor for him to sign. And he has veto power. So our budget, there is line item veto power where they can, the governor can explicitly cross out, I don't like this dollar amount that is given to this place. I don't like this whole proposal here. So the governor has the power to line item veto pieces of the budget. They can't add in anything that was removed, but they can veto. Um, and, and sometimes there is um, what's known as a veto override. If the House and the Senate both have three-fifths majority, they can override that and it becomes law. And then our new budget is um, supposed to be put in place by um, July 1st, which is the start of the new fiscal year. And so now that we've kind of talked through a little bit more of the policy nerd wonky section, I think it's really important for us to make sure that we're kind of going back to those objectives of today of talking about the importance of storytelling and really making a personal connection. So we want everyone to kind of think as you're preparing for advocacy day, when you signed up to attend, as you're on this training, what's your personal connection? Why are you advocating for young children and families? And so we'd like to do an exercise with folks here. And I see our chat is just busy, busy, busy. Um, so we want folks to share in the chat, why are you engaging in advocacy? What is your why? What motivated you to want to sign up and join us on March 8th for, for Groundwork Ohio's Advocacy Day? So we'll just give folks a few seconds here to drop in their answers um, and really thinking about what's your why? Um, because the first five years matter. Yes, yes, Shelly, that is, that is what we talk about so much at Groundwork of the importance of that investment early. Fighting for those without a voice, young children can't advocate for themselves. I wanna help family with children with disabilities. Oh, thank you, everyone. So make sure you're, you're dropping your um, your answer in there, make sure you're taking some time to kind of look and, and seeing those connections of, oh, this person here said that they have the same reason that I do. Um, and really thinking about within the early childhood space, there's so many different issues. There's so many different reasons why we come to the work. But, you know, young kids are really that um, connecting point. So now that we've shared, or now that you guys have shared your why, we want to share our why as an organization. So at Ground, Groundwork Ohio, our work is grounded in the evidence that early investments in early childhood not only benefit the well-being of children and their families, but there's a long-term uh, payoff to our state and our economy. And we know that our youngest children are our future workforce, parents, caregivers, and leaders. They're really the future of our state. So um, at Groundwork Ohio, we recently released our early childhood data dashboard. We had a webinar that I, um, I'm sure that some folks who are attending today also had the chance to, to join. And this work began in 2021 um, to really answer the question of how do we make sure that every child in Ohio has the opportunity to reach their full potential. We wanted to make sure we were informing policymakers about the realities that Ohio families with young children are facing, and we have the data to back that up. So after two years of this research and fact-finding and input from children and family experts, as well as families themselves who were impacted by these issues, we were incredibly proud to release our full data dashboard. Um, it's really a first-of-its-kind tool um, in Ohio. And our why, again, is, is kind of based in this conceptual framework. As an organization, we thought about what's our vision. Our vision, we say, is really making sure that Ohio is the best place to be a young child. So we thought about what are the building blocks to make sure that we get there? How will we know, again, if every um, if Ohio is the best place? And we, we, we knew we needed to kind of get a landscape of what the status is facing Ohio families. Um, and we knew that the solution was investing in these systems and these institutions that serve Ohioans and Ohio, uh, Ohioans um, with young children. 
And so we encourage folks, um, I think we're going to try and drop the chat into the chat. Uh, there we go, from Amy. Um, that's the link to our data dashboard. It is a very comprehensive um, uh, resource that we encourage you to explore between now and um, Advocacy Day, just to kind of get familiar with the way that uh, the data that exists around young children. And so here are those uh, five key takeaways that we found from the data. Early investments can lay the foundation for good outcomes. And I know what we saw this in the, the chat of those first few years are so important. I can see the first five years. And so that those early investments matter for children and for families, and they also matter for the well-being of our state. Um, babies are carrying the burden. They're often left um, left behind in policymaking decisions. And so we need to make sure that we are um, talking about, again, those early investments and particularly for babies. Ohio families are strong, but our systems are weak. This was something we saw when families were asked about family resiliency. A lot of families said, yes, we're resilient because we have to be. And so it is our systems that are failing families and that are preventing them from reaching their full potential that are creating those barriers and obstacles to making sure every child can reach their full potential. Um, our future depends on fostering the promise of every child. So again, the, our, our young children today are the future of tomorrow and making sure that as a state, we can be successful by investing in every single child. And the last one here is um, that there are families behind the facts. So every single data point that exists Sometimes we can get a little lost in the numbers and the statistics, but understanding that there are real families who are carrying the burden of these decisions behind every single fact. And so when we talk about the import, you know, we, we talk about the importance of investing, investing in young, um, those earliest years, but why? We know that there is a return on investment of 13% per year when we invest um, when we have those public investments in early, um, high quality prenatal to five interventions for young children. Um, when our systems and our policies and our communities are structured to support Ohio's youngest children, families can thrive and Ohio as a state can thrive. So really, again, the importance of investing early and not forgetting about that kind of prenatal to five period, which can be left out of um, a lot of policy conversations. And so when we talk about, you know, where we should invest um, through the data dashboard, we uh, selected four main kind of um, topics or sections where we think Ohio as a state should be investing. So we want to make sure that we are achieving equity and laying that strong foundation for our, young, our, um, our youngest children by investing in early learning access and quality, early childhood adversity and trauma prevention, healthcare access and quality, and economic stability. All right, so now we're going to play a story from one of our families um, who are in our Family Action Network that is housed within our Center for um, Family Voice. So Christina Hutton um, is going to share her story here. We're going to play this for you. And this just really kind of highlights the point that behind those that data, behind the facts, there are real people. And so in our data dashboard, um, we have um, a ton of data, but for each of those domains, we highlight the story of one of our families. And um, I'm gonna play Christina's story here for you. Behind every number is a real child, a real family. Their stories are as important as any statistic. I am 37 years old. I have three children. Um, I love to be involved um, in my children's lives. Um, I am my middle child's Girl Scout troop leader. I'm also on policy council of my local Head Start, where all three of my children had their early learning. When my oldest was at 
um, Head Start and they had done health checks that included hearing screenings it turns out she needed ear tubes. We do believe that's what created the mixed receptive language disorder. So she is receiving occupational therapy as well as speech therapy. And I believe that if it wasn't for the years that she went through early learning, that it wouldn't have been as easy a transition for her into kindergarten. So now she's in second grade and absolutely thriving. Uh, so my youngest was tube fed. His tube was placed when he was about six months old uh, and it was pulled when he was about three and a half years old. He had issues with seeing the other kids eating and being around other kids that weren't like him. They were excellent in giving him time to kind of regulate his emotions, giving him breaks when he needed it. He hasn't technically been diagnosed, but I do believe that my youngest has autism. One of the, the biggest things that we learned for my youngest in early learning was ways to help him regulate his emotions. It's important that I know that he has these issues and so that I can work on ways to help him succeed. I'm currently unemployed. When I was pregnant with my youngest, I had looked into childcare and the cost was going to be 350 per week for just one child and then 150 per additional child. I'm essentially still in the same position of not being able to afford rent or food once I've paid for childcare. Uh, my brother has allowed me and my children to move in and this is how I'm able to make rent and pay bills and have food on the table. So the benefits that I do receive um, are food stamps and Medicaid. If it wasn't for Medicaid, I wouldn't be able to have the occupational therapy and the speech therapy that my daughter needs. When I was looking at employment, I would have to stay under a certain dollar amount per hour and a certain hour mark during the week or it would push my kids off of insurance and I would have to pay out of pocket and when I last did the numbers it would be about $964 per month for just the premium for my children and that was before childcare. It's a vicious cycle of you want to work, you want to be productive the bottom line is without affordable child care and health care, I won't be able to get off assistance. I don't know if I see an end date. My biggest concern as they grow older and go through their educational career, I'm worried that college will be too expensive and there won't be a trade for them or a place for them. Is their education going to be enough to help them be productive, to help them be on their own and support themselves? All right. So um, thank you to, to Christina for sharing her story. Again, we know it, it's hard to be vulnerable and really share that, that personal um, story with, with folks. And we also know that that's important to moving policy forward. So um, we wanted to get some, um, some feedback from, from everybody here and really get you starting to think about how the stories that you tell that you're going to go into for Advocacy Day can really resonate with our lawmakers. So if folks can drop into the chat, um, what messages, what are those messages in Christina's story and what resonated with you specifically? I saw Becca just dropped in um, the link to uh, view Christina's story again. And those, again, that's on our data dashboard on our website. And there's a few other really powerful stories there as well. So lack of access to resources and support is hindering our families. Um, Childcare expenses, she's unable to be, uh, you know, as productive into the workforce as she'd like to be. That's the struggle for parents who truly can't afford to make more money. They're great, yeah. And, and folks, please feel free to kind of um, look through the, the chat yourself and, and see what, what people are saying. Um, she can't afford rent and food due to the, the cost of childcare. I know 
the child care issue is something that is coming up again and again and again is kind of threaded throughout so many different families. So um, we've got a, a lot of people giving their thoughts here. So um, thank you. Yeah, we, we know the importance of kind of talking about that personal face behind all these issues. All right, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Amy to um, share the next part of our training today. Thank you, Erin, and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Amy Mead. I am the director for the Center for Early Learning here at um, Groundwork, Ohio. I hope you guys are pumped. We're so excited to share the day with you. Um, I'll just share a little bit about what to expect on the day. Uh, we understand that, you know, this um, short time on our um, webinar today is not really enough to kind of prepare you for the day. So we are going to be following up after this webinar and again next week with specific information about the day, but just wanted to go through um, what the day will look like. You know, as Erin said, this is going to be an important day of learning and advocating. Um, we're going to be sharing your stories. We're going to be sharing this data on, um, you know, early childhood issues with our state legislators and their staff. Uh, our work this day will really help ensure that Ohio's children and families are prioritized during the state budget process and have the resources and opportunities they need for a strong start. And so we're excited that so many of you are going to be joining us. It really is going to be a big showing of support um, for, for the issues we're advocating on. So you'll see here um, an agenda for the day. Um, we are going to have breakfast be in registration beginning at 8 a.m. Um, we'll have the pro the official program will be um, at 8:30. We will have some remarks um, with Dr. Cynthia Osborne. We'll also have a legislative panel where we've invited some of our legislators um, to answer some questions on the budget process and kind of what what they would like to hear from you. We'll have some legislative awards, and then we'll end the program with some remarks from our keynote, Sonia Manzano. She is best known as Maria from Sesame Street. She's really great, and I think you'll all resonate with her story. Um, and then we'll schedule uh, you know, some legislative meetings. So after the program, all of us will walk over to the Rife Center, um, where we'll have our legislative meetings. Following our legislative meetings, um, there's gonna be an optional cocktail reception at the Athletic Club hosted by us and the National Black Child Development Institute Ohio. Um, you're gonna receive all this information in your folders when you arrive at registration. So there'll be a QR code for you to access with this information and other information. Um, and as well as your legislative meetings will be scheduled on the back of your name tag. So you'll receive that at um, registration. You'll get your name tag, you'll get your table number. And then on the back, it'll show who you're meeting with at what time and who in your group is gonna be meeting alongside you. So I know for many of you, this might be your first time at the state house. This might be the first time that you're meeting with your legislators. And so just want to run through a few logistics for the day. Um, many of you guys might be like, what do I wear? We encourage you to wear business casual or business professional. Um, you know, we're going to be traveling between the state house and the Rife Center. So traveling back and forth between buildings around Capitol Square. So just keep that in mind as you're deciding on what to wear. We're encouraging, um, you know, comfy shoes and be prepared for the weather. This is Ohio, so we never know what to expect on the day. So just be prepared for that. And, you know, we want um, to make sure that you guys stand out. So we're going to have some buttons, please, you know, be sure to, to wear the buttons. We want everyone to show that this is a big showing for groundwork and the work that we're doing and that we have all of your support. And, um, you know, as we uh, go through our legislative meetings that they know exactly why we're there. Um, as I mentioned, you know, you were going to be providing additional follow up for everyone on the parking options for the day closer to the event, um, but just know that there is um, a garage underneath the state house. However, this usually fills up very early, especially on days when there's committee activity and legislative session scheduled as there will be on March 8th. 
So as an alternative, we are encouraging um, all attendees to park at the Columbus Commons. It's a short distance from the, the State House. You'll see we kind of have a map here. It's a short walk. Um, this co The Commons accepts, you know, cash and credit cards for payment. But just keep that in mind that the program will start at 830. And so it might take you a minute to find parking. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're traveling to Columbus. So we're going to be hosting the program in the atrium of the Ohio State House. The atrium you'll see is highlighted here on the right hand side of um, the screen. The easiest way to enter the State House is through the Third Street entrance. You'll see the Third Street entrance labeled on the left side with the um, star on it. When you do arrive um, at the State House, you will be um, going through a security checkpoint. So backpacks and bags are allowed inside the building. You'll, you will just have them get ex inspected or they will be put through an x-ray machine. Just know that firearms and other weapons are not prohibited, are prohibited inside the state house. Um, so you'll go through a security checkpoint that includes an x-ray machine for all bags, you know, packages, personal items, and then as well as a metal detector. Um, we'll follow up with the State House Security FAQ that provides this and more information. Um, but as you enter, there's going to be a lot of signage. We're going to have staff stationed at the bottom. There's going to be, um, you know, foam core signs. And I, I just want to, you know, plug the troopers at the State House are so friendly. Every time I've gone, they're so friendly when I when I've been lost and they really know their way around the building. So if you say you're looking for the atrium, they can show exactly, you know, to help you navigate how to get there. So once you arrive in the atrium, we'll have um, some registration set up for you to check in. So you'll provide um, your name and then we'll give you your name tag, your table number and your groundwork pin. We will have people from the same organization group together, um, along with trying to match you with other people in your region whom you might be going to meetings with later that day. Uh, we will provide resources at your table, including an agenda of the day, some fact sheets and more. And I know Erin um, will go through this um, later in, in this webinar, but I know some of you guys are wondering, what am I going to talk about with my legislator? We're going to be providing you on your folders with, with county fact sheets, with budget fact sheets, and giving you some uh, talking points so you can see this is the data and this is how my story you know reflects this data or informs the work that I do um, so don't I don't want you to get too nervous we're going to provide you with a lot of material to help guide your conversations when you meet at the um, when you meet with your legislators and I know that that's a lot we will um, have some time at the end for some Q&A but we're, again we're our staff is really excited um, you know we're 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 excited to get to meet you and kind of, you know, share this day together. So thank you for being there. Great. Thank you, Amy. So um, as Amy said, you know, our, these legislative meetings are um, a really important part of the day. It's really kind of the highlight of, of Advocacy Day is actually going and doing advocacy to our state lawmakers. Um, so Groundwork Ohio is handling the scheduling of all meetings uh, with lawmakers. So don't worry about having to reach out to your lawmaker and try and schedule your own meeting. Um, our staff is managing that behind the scenes. And we are, um, I know there was a question in the chat that we answered. So we've reached out to every legislative office. Uh, this was an all invite to, um, to join us for lunch and then um, every legislative office to try and get a meeting um, as we said, the budget is a really, really busy time. So there's legislative committee um, hearings happening. There's session later that day. There's a ton of other groups going in there to advocate. So we're trying our hardest to make sure that we can schedule a meeting with all lawmakers, but we know that that's going to be impossible. So we've been really encouraged by the responses and the um, excitement that we've gotten from legislative offices about uh, setting up a meeting with, with their constituents and with, with all of you. And um, we're working to continue to, to get some last minute meetings um, scheduled over the next two weeks before advocacy day. 
So um, just know, and we'll kind of walk through this a little bit later, but just know that we are, again, are working really hard to make sure that the legislator themselves is able to attend the meeting. Um, but we know that's going to be, um, you know, not possible in many circumstances if they have a committee they need to be a part of or a bill that they're, um, you know, doing testimony on. So um, you may be meeting with a legislator themselves or a legislative aide and just know that that is just as important. So um, the, the legislative aides are really kind of those gatekeepers in the office. They're the ones who prepare a legislator before a vote before they introduce a bill. And so those the meetings with legislative aides are just as important and just as effective as meeting with the legislator themselves. Um, you are going to be in small groups. So you will not be going to meetings by yourself. Do not be worried about that. You'll be with um, a group of folks who are from the same region as you. Um, and we're, we're gonna try again really hard to make sure that you're meeting with your legislative office. If for some reason, that legislator is not available, we'll make sure you're grouped with someone who's in your general region. Um, we will have what we're calling, you know, team leaders who um, will, are, are folks who have done this before, um, and really their responsibility is to make sure the legislator gets the folder that we are leaving behind with the, the resources that Amy referenced, as well as just, um, you know, taking notes and making sure that the meeting kind of runs smoothly um, during during the time that you're meeting with these offices. So because of the logistics behind the scenes that we're dealing with right now, unfortunately, um, folks will not, um, you'll receive your um, legislative meetings and your schedule on the day of. You'll have um, a form on the back of your um, name tag that, that shows explicitly who your legislative meeting is with, what time it's at. And so we really encourage you again to use that legislative website to look up the legislator that you're meeting with, get familiar with them and, and the work that they do. And as Amy shared, we'll be providing those resources. So you feel comfortable going into that meeting, um, talking with your group before you go in and just really feeling prepared and ready to go on the day of. So after the program ends around um, between like you know, one and one thirty is when we're going to start legislative meetings. Um, you'll be going, we'll be taking everyone over from the state house to what's known as the Rife Center. That's where the house offices are. Um, you'll be having your house meetings um, at the beginning of that block. We have some time, uh, excuse me, we have some space in the Rife Center for folks if maybe you have a later meeting or um, you have some time before your meeting and you just want to grab some refreshments look over your packet, check your email, you know, uh, just decompress a little bit. We will have that space in one of the theaters um, available for people that they can just hang out and get ready for the rest of the day. Um, your meetings will likely last about 15 minutes, between like 15 and 30 minutes for meetings, which we know can feel like a short time, but it's again, a very busy time. And we're, we're grateful for um, the ability to be able to have so many meetings set up with with our legislators that day. So that'll give you some time to, to make sure everyone can do introductions. Um, you can talk through uh, the issues, talk through the problem and then pivot to the solution. And again, we'll provide a, ver a condensed version of our policy agenda that will have those specific asks that you can make of legislators. And then it's listening to the lawmakers themselves hearing what they have to say about your ask, hearing what they have to say about the, the um, issues you're talking about and making sure that you're taking notes and capturing what happens in that meeting. And so um, Amy shared a little bit about the, the security at the State House. There's also some security for the Rice Center. One of the most important things is that they do require a state, a valid state issued ID for you to enter the building. So please, please, please make sure that you have that for, um, for being able to go in and do your meetings with the House members. There'll be a few different registration checkpoints, and we're going to have some um, staff or volunteers stationed throughout the Rife Center to help point you in the right direction. So there's also an x-ray machine and um, a metal detector um, that you'll, you'll go through at the Rife Center, and um, you will uh, be scanned into 
the elevators, you go to the floor that's marked on your name tag, and then you'll go into the reception desk on that floor, let them know that you're there for Groundwork Ohio's Advocacy Day to meet with Representative so-and-so, and they will take care of you to have an aide come out and get you and take you back for your meeting. And so one of the first things that I think if, if you've ever done this before might pop into your head is how do I address my policymaker? Um, so we typically just, you know, just to show, um, you know, respect for the position and, and to make sure that um, we're being respectful during our meetings, um, we use uh, the kind of uh, general terms uh, or titles that our, our legislators have. For advocacy day, that will be representative so-and-so or senator so-and-so if you're meeting with the legislator themselves. And when it comes to having these meetings with legislators, we wanted to highlight really three important things to remember as you're going in there and having these meetings. And this is true for meeting with legislative um, aides as well. So as we've said, your voice is powerful and it can really make a difference. So remembering, you know, it may be intimidating meeting with a legislator or an aide, but you're an expert in your own experience. And so you have every right to be there you are an expert in really owning your story and, and being there to advocate on behalf of your family and your community and Ohio's youngest children. And also remember that you're not there alone. You're First off, you're in a group of other folks who care about these issues. And I know we've seen some activity in the chat of the, a lot of the thread connectors between all of us, but you're also a part of this broader community. There'll be 400 of us there on Advocacy Day and there are so many more people who care about these issues and who stand with you when it comes to advocating for early childhood. And lastly, just you know, really remembering that legislators and legislative staff are people with their own stories, their own lived experience, and their own families. So um, you know, maybe there is something that is said that you don't agree with, or you know, maybe a meeting doesn't go the way you wanted it to, but understanding that we all have to kind of connect back to this is a person who has their own lived experience. They're here for a reason, maybe trying to, to peel that back and get and really connect on a personal level and understanding that um, that may be a motivating uh, reason for why they work on early childhood issues themselves because they have young, a young uh, child at home in their family or they really care about the, um, the child care center in their community. And so being able to really um, make that personal connection with your legislators when you're in there. And so um, a really important piece of our legislative meetings is making sure that you're walking in there with an ask. So I know when we have our meetings with legislators, we kind of talk through who groundwork is and the data and the stories. And the next question is, okay, so what can I do about it? What do you want me to do? So always make sure that you're identifying that problem and then you're pivoting to the solution. So we're going to drop our policy agenda. This is a, a longer document than you will receive on Advocacy Day. So please know that this is a very broad agenda right now. But um, making sure that you're using that policy agenda and you're, you know, in a few minutes before you go in with your group, you're really talking as a group to say, well, these are the one or two top priorities we want to make sure that we're going in and we're talking about and we're asking our legislator to do. Um, so making sure you're determining that ask and you're giving them solutions to the problems that you're talking about. And understanding who your audience is. So we talked about why it's so important to look up your, the legislator you're meeting with to kind of get to know their background a little bit more, the issues they work on. Um, you know, you don't wanna go into a meeting with someone who has championed these issues for so long and talk about, uh, you know, getting kind of bogged down in, in why this matters, they know that. So what you should be doing in that meeting is really thanking them for what they've done, sharing your story, and then asking for more and asking for them to continue to be a champion on these issues and really raising them up to say, we need your voice in this work and we really need you to prioritize this in the budget advocacy that you as a legislator are doing among, amongst your colleagues as well. Um, seeing, you know, do they serve on finance committee? That gives them power during, a lot more power during the budget process. Are they a part of leadership? That gives them um, a lot of power too to be able to, to really work with the leadership in those chambers and within their caucuses 
to set the priority of what the budget will look like. So making sure that you're um, doing a quick Google search, using that free legislative website, and looking up your lawmakers before you go into those meetings. And so just a few other kind of tips and tricks that we hope um, we can provide you with as you're, um, you're getting ready to go in for advocacy day. Again, meeting with a staffer is just as important. It's not a snub. It, it, it doesn't mean that your meeting is less important than someone who's meeting with the legislator. It just means that that office, that person is very busy and maybe they have a conflict at the time that your meeting is set. So understanding that again, those legislative aides are the people that our staff go to when we have, you know, we give them a call, we have a, a you know, quick thing that we saw in this bill that we wanna talk about. And so meeting with the staffer is super important and can be just as effective as meeting with the legislators themselves. Before you just jump into all the data and the stories, make sure you're introducing yourself. Talk about um, if you're there with an organization, what that organization is, really helping the legislator or the aide understand who they're meeting with that day. But also knowing that you're gonna be in a group. So be respectful of timing, make sure you're not monopolizing the conversation. We wanna make sure that everybody who's in that meeting has a chance to share who they are and their story and have a, a, a chance to participate in the meeting. Um, and to that point, make sure you're listening. So you're listening to the other folks in your group, but you're also listening to what the legislator or legislative aide says. And um, we're gonna have an opportunity for folks to kind of report back and say, oh, so representative so-and-so was really interested in this specific piece of the budget when we met with them. And so listening, taking those notes, making sure that we understand as a, a groundwork staff, anything that comes out of those meetings that may be important for the continued advocacy that we do beyond advocacy day. Uh, this is a really important one that I've, I've learned and I've used myself um, during testimony of making sure that if you don't know the answer, that's okay. Not everyone knows everything about everything. If, if they ask you a question that you don't know, don't try and make something up or um, you know, try and recall something that you don't know 100%. Just tell them, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, but we'll follow up with you and we'll get you that information. Um, and then make sure we do that follow up. So again, letting our staff know, you know, that Senator asked about the number of childcare centers in their district. That's something that we can, you know, follow up with them afterwards and make sure that they have the information that they need and we're making that extra touch with their office. Um, making a clear ask, again, we just talked about this of, of making sure you're going in there and confidently leaving with, here's what we want you to do with the state budget. Um, if you leave without the ask, um, they're not gonna know, you know, as a group, what we want them to do with the budget. And then lastly, um, thanking your policymaker or the staffer for meeting with you. So again, um, their schedules are going to be incredibly chaotic during this time. And so um, making sure you're showing that gratitude for, for meeting with, um, with you and your group and for if they are champions in these issues, again, thanking them for that, making sure that they know that there's folks out there who are seeing what they're doing and they feel motivated to continue to do that. And so when you leave your, um, your meetings um, on advocacy day, there are some immediate follow-up actions that we, we were asking folks to do. Make sure you're writing down what you've learned. And again, we'll have an opportunity um, to debrief with staff and we'll send um, a survey after the event where you can also kind of plug in, oh, here's a, a good nugget of information that we learned during our legislative meetings. Um, share information and pictures from your meeting. So Beck is gonna, our communications director is gonna talk about this in the next section. Um, ask them if you can take a picture. Um, make sure that we are again loud, not just in the state house, but we're, we're loud on social media and we're showing Thank you, Senator so-and-so for meeting with us. We hope that you take action for young kids. So that's a really um, you know, important piece of making sure that you get permission to take a picture um, or you can take a picture outside of their office, maybe with like the name, the, the name plate there. Um, and sending a thank you note. So we'll provide you with a thank you note that you can fill out and you can hand to them right after your meeting, making sure that again, we have that extra touch of a handwritten thank you note, letting them know that we appreciate their time and that we hope that they'll continue to uh, champion these issues. 
right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Becca for our section on communications. Hi everyone, I'm Becca Thomas, Director of Communications uh, for Groundwork Ohio, and I'm thrilled to be here with you and really looking forward to seeing you all on March 8th, just two short weeks. Let's hope it's even half of a gorgeous day as we, what we have today. Um, I appreciate you all sticking with us, especially on a day like today, and I know you might be thinking, you know, we got some great information, great details on the day, but what exactly are we supposed to be saying in these meetings? So we're going to talk through that a little bit right now. We want to make sure you feel as prepared as possible so you can go into your meeting and have a really effective conversation. Your advocacy is really only as strong as your messaging and your voice that delivers it. And effective communication can really help inspire and motivate your lawmakers. So what's the recipe for putting together a really strong case in front of a policymaker? There's a few ingredients and you really want to start by articulating clearly your issue or challenge. I would really encourage you over the next few weeks to take time and kind of practice your conversation, practice your part of the conversation. Start with your introduction, say it to yourself, say it out loud with a friend or colleague, someone you might be coming to advocacy day with, even write it down and really think through what issue or challenge you want to bring to your policymaker and some follow-up questions or challenges they might have for you. When discussing your challenge, it's really helpful to even bring forth a solution. It could be funding more child care centers, expanding benefits for the workforce, or supporting the workforce more fully so your child care center can operate at full capacity. Be a part of solution with your policymaker and come up with a few ideas already thought through. You can always refer to the policy agenda that we shared and we'll provide for you on uh, every C day. And I hope you know that this isn't the last time you'll be seeing these documents. You'll get everything in a paper folder handed to you the morning of the 8th. And we'll also have a QR code that will link to a landing page where you have all these documents electronically. We've sent you a lot of materials. We're going to send you a lot more materials and they're really important. And the data is not the only thing that's compelling. Really having a personal connection and a personal tie will really convey your passion. The most important thing you can convey, in fact, is your passion and why you're so connected. Is it someone in your family that's dealt with this situation, someone you're serving, someone in your community? Um, even sharing a photo or a quick anecdote of why you're so connected really can go a long way. Through practice, really ensure your message is targeted and focused and make your short time in that policymaker's office really count. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll see, you know, we're asking you to use your big voice for little kids on March 8th. And one way to really turn up the volume on your big voice is through social media. Envision it as sort of the megaphone that really enables you to make, to reach a bigger and broader audience. Um, and as a way to connect with your policymaker even before or after your meeting with them. We'll provide you with the handles or the tags of your policymakers on Advocacy Day. So if you have time before then, between now and then, I would encourage you to look up your policymaker. Maybe you already have the link open from when you did the exercise earlier today. On their bio page, they often have their direct links to if they're on Twitter or Facebook, get to know them. What are they posting about? What are they sharing? What are they reacting to? Um, it's another, another way to have a dialogue with them about something that might connect you. Um, you can also use this then on Advocacy Day to then respond to your policymaker, thank them for the time, thank their office if you just met with the aid, um, and post resources. Again, the links we'll share with you on Advocacy Day, you'll have a URL too. You can just include that link right in your tweet. Um, it's just another touch point. And while you can really get stuck in a rabbit hole and spend hours on social media, crafting a well-worded tweet with some details, some links, really only takes a few minutes, especially if you take a few, uh, some time ahead of time to get your ideas in order. Some more tips that we'll talk through on social media. Um, we can go on the next slide, Erin. Um, Twitter is really the most effective tool, followed by Facebook. If you're not active on Twitter, if you're maybe more of a listener or a lurker, or you haven't really dipped your toe in the pool, this could be a really good time to do so. Um, you know, with each platform you're on, especially I think with Twitter, you can really curate your network and follow and, and learn from who you want to learn from. News outlets, policymakers, celebrities, authors, whoever you want to engage with, you can build your Twitter feed with those people. Um, imagine Twitter kind of like a cocktail party. You know, if you put a tweet out, it's just kind of like you're talking to the person closest to you. If you tag someone, tag a policymaker, for example, you are bringing them into the conversation. If you use a hashtag, that's another way to make your spotlight a little bit broader, make your megaphone a little bit louder. Um, we'll get into hashtags again on the next slide. We're going to be talking about that and how we're using them on Advocacy Day, but it's just another way to really uh, broadcast your message. Kind of the most important thing, the golden rule for social media, though, is to really think through your comments. Would you say it face to face? 
you know, we really want you to be careful when you're being critical of policymakers, um, especially on March 8th, March 8th. Your words do reflect back on groundwork when you're here on behalf of our advocacy day. So just really think through if you would say those words um, or have that comment directly to them. So now to engage with us on social media on and before advocacy day. If you haven't already, please do follow us on all the channels. We're everywhere. And if you haven't already, we'd love to, anytime you're doing some advocacy work, you know, by joining today, or if you're if you're working on your speech in the next couple of days, make sure you tag us. We'd love to see that. We can uplift your tweet. And again, make your megaphone that much bigger. We're going to be using these hashtags. You can see here, hashtag Big Voices Little Kids 2023 and hashtag Advocacy Day 2023 on March 8th. Um, kind of a cool way to think about a hashtag before they really took on a life of their own is kind of like a file folder. You know, if, if you want to put something, a note, a link, an article in this Advocacy Day file folder, you can click on it when you're on Twitter or Facebook online and see anyone else who's used that similar hashtag. So you'll see our tags are kind of generic, but also specific. So we can narrow in on our specific day and then also see who else is, if you check Advocacy Day 2023, you can see other groups that are already meeting and the kinds of things that they're doing. Another way to make your voice even louder is to share photos from Advocacy Day. As Aaron said earlier, ask if it's appropriate to take a selfie with your group in front of your policymaker's office or even with them. Um, they might love it just to have a little more promotion and pictures really do go a thousand words. And really, you know, start with gratitude. Thank the policymaker, thank their office for meeting with you. It's a busy time, busy schedules. And, you know, I think anytime we can start with some positivity would be helpful and kind of help our message get out a little more. So really the key that we've talked about now is fine tuning your message, focusing, working on clarity and bringing your passion forward. Ellen Chavez is a woman who is in our early childhood leadership fellowship and she's a home visitor and she has a background that led her to pursue this career in home visiting and that really brings forth her passion. So as part of our fellowship, she shared her story on our graduation day for the Early Childhood Leadership Fellowship. And we just wanted to share her video with you as an example of someone who's really worked on their message, brought forth their personal connection, and who uses it to advocate today. Ellen has always had a heart for working with young children. She was a nanny for uh, children, infant to five years old, before she became a teacher for children on the spectrum. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology, and now, like Sandra, is a home visitor. She works part-time at Help Me Grow in Erie County. Ellen is proudly married to an Ecuadorian, and together they have two children. Sweet yet feisty Annie is six years old, and in first grade, and caring and funny Enzo is four years old. They also have two dogs, Hudson and Snoopy. I love that name. Ellen's story is personal and vulnerable. And like me, I am sure that there are many other mothers in the room that will relate. It is a topic that we need to be talking more about. And I am so honored to be able to introduce Ellen Chavez to share her story with you today. Let's welcome Ellen to the stage. Six years ago, I was preparing for the amazing birth experience I had always dreamed about. I knew this baby inside me so well. Every move, how she reacted to the foods I ate, and the way she responded to the sound of my voice. I was imagining what she would look like, feel like, and what her cries would sound like. I knew for a long time that I wanted a baby, and I wanted that moment of meeting her to be perfect. After many long, painful, and useless hours that my body refused to work with me, I remember the doctor telling me the baby's heart rate had dropped. And the next thing I knew, I was being wheeled into an operating room. I was devastated. And at the same time, extremely concerned for my baby. The last thing I remember hearing was, well, we're gonna have to knock her out. 
Then I opened my eyes in an extremely loud, bright, and freezing room. I felt cold, weak, and exhausted. I then realized I was half naked as a nurse quickly moved my gown and placed a baby on my chest. I remember looking down at her thinking, that's right, I was pregnant, and this must be my baby. Not quite the picture perfect moment I had dreamed of. I quickly felt guilt and shame for those thoughts, but I also felt sad and confused. There was a really big disconnect for me, and maybe for my Annie too. Fast forward to a very short six weeks later, I had to leave my beautiful Annie with my amazing husband, Gustavo, who was working second shift so I could return to my first shift teaching job. We had no other options if we wanted to be able to keep food on our table because I had already spent three weeks with no pay. I remember feeling the pain inside my body as I walked into my job hating that I was there and not home with my Annie. And I realized one night as Annie screamed and screamed and screamed that I was utterly alone. And this was only the beginning. The next months were truly terrifying. The worst night was when my husband, Gustavo, handed Annie to me and asked me to feed her. I told him no. He looked at me and said, what? I looked him in the eyes and I said, I told you no. I don't want to feed her. You do it. Fortunately, I snapped out of this quick moment of a mental break and I did feed her. But this was the beginning of my husband realizing I was not okay. After that day, I felt lost, guilty, and confused. I just kept crying and thought this would never get better. I continuously told my husband, I'm a horrible mother. I would call him crying every day he was at work. And in one desperate time when I couldn't reach him, I called my cousin who lived in South Carolina. I was sobbing. I told her, the baby won't stop screaming. She's not sick and I have tried everything to try to calm her. I don't know what to do. I realized in that very moment that this is how a person shakes their own baby. Thankfully, I did not do this. But I felt the anger inside my body and every nerve was on fire telling me to do something as Annie continued to scream and seemed to find no comfort in me or anything that I tried. My cousin said, just put her down in her crib and walk away to give yourself a break. I am so thankful she answered her phone that day and for the words that she spoke to me. She let me know that it was okay to put her down in a safe place and to breathe. Had she not answered her phone, I'm not sure how I would have handled the next minutes of my baby's screams. Postpartum depression is a lonely place to be. And with no supports, a woman can be lost in her own despair, unable to properly care for her baby. My cousin was my saving grace in a very dark and lonely moment. She picked up her phone and she was there for me. Today, as a home visitor, I get to be there for other new mothers and fathers in the same way that my cousin was there for me almost six years ago. Home visiting is for women and families in poverty who are giving birth with many more challenges, barriers, and at times even less support than I had. I am a listening ear to validate and to encourage and to help mothers and fathers find joyful moments with their new baby when the world around them has created obstacles and endless amounts of stress. Making the difference for a mother to know they can pick up the phone or knowing that I will be back every week to see them and their baby. 
a little bit off script. Two weeks ago, I had um, a father actually tell me that he got so frustrated with his baby and he remembered that he needed to take a break and he asked his girlfriend to take the baby. I was so proud of him and told him, it's amazing that you made that choice. Our babies need us, but we are human and we feel that pain inside of us as they cry. And it's so important that they give that baby to someone else. This is why my work as a home visitor is crucial. New motherhood is a joy and a blessing as fatherhood is too, but it is also hard, stressful, and quickly can become overwhelming. Thank you. Thank you for watching Ellen's story. You'll see I posted the link to her story in the chat um, if you want to watch it again or share it with anyone else. Um, and I'll just leave you with, if you can remember and hang on to Ellen's passion. You can see what she had been through a terrible circumstance. She channeled into passion, uses it for her advocacy today. So really take some time if you can over the next two weeks, find a friend or a colleague who's attending and just talk through them how, what you're what your passion is, what your why is. Practice in front of the mirror, even try to kind of maybe think through what you're gonna wear that day so you can kind of feel really like you're there, channel your moment with your policymaker. So reach out anytime with questions and we look forward to seeing you in just two short weeks. Great, thank you so much, Becca. Um, yes, I can see some folks posting in the chat that no matter how many times I watch that video, it's, it's so emotional and so vulnerable and so powerful. So huge thanks to, to Ellen for sharing her story. Um, so next, um, you know, in the last couple minutes we have together here, we're just gonna walk through some immediate next steps and um, take some time to answer any last minute questions folks may have. So as we're talking through this slide, if you have any other lingering questions, please drop that into the Q&A function and our staff will either answer it um, via text in there or we can answer it live in the last couple minutes here. So there are some, some things within the next uh, less than two weeks, uh, which is, is wild to think about, um, before Advocacy Day that we hope that you'll continue to do to stay engaged. Um, using the resources and content in your virtual folder to prepare for the day. So you should have been, you should be receiving, if you have um, registered for Advocacy Day, you should be receiving emails from us on a pretty regular basis that provide you with some um, videos to watch or an article to read or a resource to look into. So we'll continue to utilize that function over the next um, couple of weeks here leading up to advocacy day. Um, as Becca talked about, you know, social media can be a really great place for us to get our message out too. So um, post on social media, tag groundwork, let us know how you're feeling and, and um, sharing to other folks how excited you are for advocacy day. Um, and using that, that Advocacy Day hashtag to, um, to add to the excitement. And then lastly, um, look for more information to come to us and follow up for this training. So we're gonna send an email, I believe tomorrow, that provides you with the slides and the, um, the recording and any other information that you need to know um, coming out of this training ahead of Advocacy Day. And so now we will, um, in the last couple minutes here, answer some questions. So I see we have, um, oh, and uh, Becca just dropped into the chat, all the virtual um, folder content avail that is available. So please make sure um, that you, um, you utilize that and can click there. Um, so the questions that we have, um, and again, we've been answering some of these throughout the presentation, but uh, Elizabeth asks um, if, we have staff that are registered for the event and can no longer attend, should they unregister in some manner? Yes, we are really, really close to capacity. So any extra seats that you know someone can attend, we wanna make sure we fill with somebody who can be there. So if you can reach out to um, our director of advancement, uh, Carol Argero, um, with any of your uh, kind of registration pieces, um, I'm going to, uh, or Becca, can you drop her email into the chat just so that folks have that or into the Q&A function? 
um, she will uh, work behind the scenes to take that person off the registration and then we'll have an extra slot for, for um, somebody to attend. So thank you, Elizabeth, for being proactive about that. Um, Valerie asked, do we call legislative aid legislative aid? Um, you can just call, they, they usually are fine with you just calling them by their first name. Um, that is totally fine. Um, you know, the, the kind of let us, you know, representative senator uh, is, is really more so for the legislator. Um, if you want, if you want to, you can, but we typically just kind of call them by their first name and um, they're, they're usually really great about that and comfortable with that. All right, any last questions in the last minute or couple minutes we have here, please drop it into Q&A. Uh, Lisa asks, will the data points that Groundwork provides us with be specific to the issue we signed up to advocate for, or are these general data points related to Groundwork Ohio's priorities? Lisa, that is a great question. So um, the data that we're providing, we will be providing fact sheets on a number of I think I believe five different kind of issue focuses related to Groundwork Ohio's priorities in the budget. Um, and your legislators will, will in their folder be provided with some county specific data that relates to the counties they represent. Um, that is all Groundwork branded um, and is focused on um, those main buckets around early learning and then maternal young child health um, that relate to the budget specifically. So um, because this is a groundwork event, um, we, we've been providing that information that is specifically tied to our policy agenda um, and that will be provided to attendees on the, the day of, as well as in legislator folders. Okay, so before we conclude things, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to drop that into the um, into the chat, uh, excuse me, into the Q&A function. Um, and we wanna make sure that, you know, you, you leave here without any questions and you're ready to go for the day. So um, for the, the last activity of the day uh, of this training, um, we want to know how you're feeling ahead of Advocacy Day. I know I'm feeling, um, I was already excited, but I'm, I'm really feeling all the buzz and excitement um, generating, even though we are not in the same room together right now, just from the activity in the chat and some of the engagement we've had. So if folks can drop into the chat, how are you feeling ahead of Advocacy Day? Excited, empowered, I'm pumped, I'm so happy to be a part of this. Oh, I love this. Great. Everyone is excited. That's how we, <laughs> curious. Oh, I like that. I like that, Erin. Um, great. Um, Dawn, we will have tons of signage and staff there. I know you said you're feeling a little nervous about not being able to find your way around. We will help you. Um, you, you will not be able to miss us. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely have um, that signage available to make sure that you, you know where you're going. So, perfect. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, and if folks want to kind of keep dropping your thoughts in here, but um, that is it for our advocacy day training. And we are giving you all five, five minutes back in your day to kind of rest if you have maybe another meeting or something you have to run to. So again, thank you so much um, for joining us today. We really, really look forward to meeting you all in person on March 8th. And we're excited to, um, to see your excitement and that you are feeling empowered and ready to go. So um, again, we'll follow up with everybody on Friday with um, an email follow up from this presentation. And then we'll see you in two weeks at the State House. So thank you all so much. <laughs>